hello, everyone. Settling in, take some seats. Welcome to the Aesthetics of the Future. I want to start with a single question. And if you guys can indulge me for a moment, I know this is awkward, but close your eyes just for a moment. And I want you all to imagine, how do you personally think that the future will look and feel? What are the aesthetics of the future? And to be clear, I'm not talking about what technology will exist. I'm talking about what smells, what sounds, what materials, what colors, what textures. How does it phys physically feel to be in this future? I'm going to give you guys like five solid seconds to go into your own personal futures. Some of you are cheating and have your eyes open. <laughs> OK. All right, come back to the present. Anyone want to share? What were they picturing? What do you think the aesthetics of the future will be? And I know some of you by name, so if you don't volunteer, I'm literally going to call on you. <laughs> so you probably should volunteer. <laughs> Naz. I've got pink, spicy, warm. It's amazing. And no more than that. Who knows? I can imagine it. I mean, spicy is a good choice. OK, someone else? White, rounded corners. Yes. 50% transparency glass. Yes. Look at the specificity. You are totally a designer. <laughs> I know. Actually, the literal opposite of it is. OK, but, you, but like in your heart and in your soul somewhere in there. <laughs> Anyone else? Anyone have a completely different future they were picturing? Awesome, that's amazing. All right, so guys, we are way more sophisticated than most of humanity because I have some really, really scary news. When I do a Google search for the future, this is the only thing that comes up. This is where most of humanity seems to be stuck. This is apparently what the future is going to look like. Blue brains firing off digital activity and white robots in a creepy cyber world. I'm not sure this is the spicy, pastel, beautiful future that I actually want to live in. As one critic put it, which I love, code dribbling down foreheads and noses. That's the aesthetic of the future. That's terrifying, you guys. But I have to admit something to you. Oh, no, I ruined it. <laughs> OK, pretend I didn't do that. Um, I have to admit something to you. I was a total cyberpunk kid. And so this aesthetic was all of my dreams growing up. This is me, yeah, like pink hair, nose ring. I had Bjork buns. I taught myself how to code by looking at the source code of websites. And to me, this aesthetic represented everything that my life in a little hippie town in Vermont was not, right? It was like, I was like, I'm so sophisticated and I'm glamorous and I'm living this cyberpunk reality. And I decided that I would teach myself how to code. I taught myself Photoshop and I created you can judge. The first Ani DeFranco tribute website in the <laughs> 1990s, where I put my profuse design skills to use. And all of my design cliches about what I thought the future would look like, there's probably a lens flare in like every single one of these, because I was convinced that lens flares were the future. And I vividly remember thinking, this is not a joke, oh man, I am nailing this, and this is the future. Like, this is it. And then with all of the flagrant confidence of a 16-year-old, I decided I was going to start my own web design studio um, named, and wait for that, it's horrible, but amazing, New Fusion Design, which was going to blend art and design and technology in this very exciting new way. Uh, this literally was cutting edge at the time. I'm not kidding. So to be clear, none of this critique of the future aesthetics is an academic elitist perspective of them, those people who are doing this. I am guilty too. I was super guilty of creating this aesthetic back in its early days. But we're not in the 90s anymore. And that's what I think really worries me most. When I moved to Dubai about a year ago, I was super inspired by this nation's fascination with the future and everything that it reflects. But very often, I was also a little bit embarrassed of some of the visual cliches that we seem to still be stuck in. Like, why are we repeating the same visual choices that I made 
as a teenager in like the 80s and the 90s when we have the opportunity to create rich new visual languages and experiences today. To be clear, there are some absolutely beautiful things happening here. I'm not saying all of the aesthetic of Dubai and everything that the UAE is doing is dated and bad. I think this very building that we're sitting in represents the aesthetic of the future. And I'd be curious to see the, this explored even more. What would happen if the aesthetics of the future was born from a, uh, um, an Arabic design language, not a Western design language? If we stopped taking cliches from that world and instead looked at some of the beautiful things that this nation and this region has to offer. I mean, the smells of this area alone, you guys know what I'm talking about. It is, it is spectacular and it's sensory and it's beautiful and some of the textures and the use of light and sound and pattern. Why aren't we drawing on that? Why are we drawing on the old cliches? I think what I'm trying to say is that why follow dated Western visuals when we're leading a new global conversation about what the future could look like. It all made me start to wonder, where did these aesthetics of the future come from and why have they lasted? What does it say about us as a society? What are we craving when we're visualizing the future? How might visions of the future better connect to our past and what matter to us deep down? Oops, oh no, we'll do it again. And importantly, who gets to decide what the future looks like? And why aren't we hearing more diverse voices? So tonight, I want to invite you all, join me on a journey to the other side of cliche that is not at all blue brains firing off cyber activity, but instead new visions and provocations that buck the norm and imagine entirely new ways that the future could look and feel. Because maybe the future is more pastel, maybe it's more fuzzy, maybe there's floating flowers, maybe this fog is actually intelligent digital systems as opposed to just glowing screens. We need a more multicultural, multidisciplinary, and multisensory view on what the aesthetics of the future could be. If you only remember one thing I say tonight, that's the conversation. That's what I want to remember. So to understand how we got to where we are, we're gonna do a little mini history lesson of the aesthetics of the future. And I wanna gift you all this amazing term. Do you know, anyone know what Z-Rust is? At all, is anyone? Matt kind of knows. Do you kind of know? You don't wanna guess. <laughs> no, so Z-Rust is the particular kind of datedness which affects things which, that were originally designed to look futuristic. Right? Like we look back and we're going to go back in history and we're all going to mock it. But at the time, it was literally cutting edge. So let's all remember that and probably recognize that right now we are Z rusting our aesthetic of the future. We will look back on this moment and be like, oh my God, that was so embarrassing. <laughs> so, one thing I realized while looking back is that the dominant tech obsession of the age is the thing that has defined the aesthetic of the future at that given moment. Whatever the technology was, that was how we currently saw the future. So from the first moments that humans existed, of course we imagined what the future would look like, whether that just meant a more amazing hunting season or an entirely new utopia. This is actually the first time the word utopia was ever used and visualized as an entirely new world. But here I wanna skip way ahead and not the dawn of humanity, but actually the dawn of one of the most important technologies that shifted the conversation of what the future will look like the dawn of automation. So the 1950s, radical moment of plastic optimism where we believed that technology was gonna revolutionize every single thing about our lives, about how we lived, about how we worked. Disney created, for example, you all probably remember Tomorrowland, fabulous, bubbly, automated world that was defined, it was one of the first times actually that um, the future equals silver became a cliche. Because at the time, silver was like so cutting edge that of course that would be the future. And this was an aesthetic designed to reflect this motion into the future. So visually it had parabolas and sweeping hues. This aesthetic is actually called Googie. Has everyone heard of that? It's like, I often wonder if like that's where Google got their name from. You've heard of it. Um, some of the most amazing things from the 50s are actually not from America at all, of course but like Japanese space cowboys, incredible. 
And one of my favorite things about looking back on how we used to view the aesthetics of the future was seeing how much we underestimated how certain things would change, like we assumed, or how much we overestimated. We assumed we would live on the moon, but we underestimated how much some of the most basic day-to-day -day qualities and activities would change. Like we'd still live in white picket fences, but we'd be living on the moon, right? Or like making bird houses, because that's the hobby we all do right now, but like in our moving car. Um, it's probably why in the 50s we predicted cell phones, but we did not predict women in the workplace, right? 60s, the dominant tech of this moment, space travel. So imagine the moment, it's 1960s, you're a young kid, and you watch humanity land on the moon. Oh my God, you were convinced that we were going to the moon, that there was gonna be this massive revolution, we were all gonna party in space, and so the aesthetic represented humans going to party in space. Smooth shines, there was almost this architectural geometric tailoring that started popping up. Um, and you start to see, as opposed to the googie aesthetic of those like sweeping parabolas, much more triangles and geometry and really crazy cool different shapes. But the 60s was also a time of radical social transformation, right? So the age of Aquarius was happening, people are having this massive enlightenment, and they started imagining that maybe the future wasn't just technical, it was spiritual. Maybe they were going to a different plane of existence altogether. I know I'm not supposed to pick, fav pick favorites, but the 70s, the age of glam grooviness, is probably by far my favorite aesthetic of the future that existed in the past. This was a future that shimmered and shined with brilliance. It was prismatic, it was magical. I mean, no one is gonna be David Bowie in terms of an aesthetic of the future. Like, that's just the rule. There was this vibrant, saturated, gooey, kind of pastel-y uh, pattern where basically the world was plush. It was decadent, there was a lushness to it. And this is not, you know, I'm not like making fun of the past by being how silly was it what we used to think. This is legitimately good. This is legitimately beautiful. There was joy. The future was bright. By the way, this is totally Gucci today. They are loving some glam 70s futurism. So like, let's all recognize that it's coming full circle. All right, 80s. Some of you may have grown up in the 80s. The aesthetic of the future then was the age of neon dreams. Dominant technology, of course, personal computation. And so we had this fantasy that we would merge man and machine. We would become one. We would literally go into the world like Tron and come out the other side as this spatial planes geometric map kind of thing. And the visual embodiment of the design language of the future in the 80s was in a single word, neon. It was just neon. That was gonna be the answer. And everything from the way that the typography was treated to even some of the exposed gears and machinery, this was the first time we're not trying to hide the tech, but in fact, we brought it to the surface and celebrated it. We said, this is beautiful, let's show it off. This was the predecessor to the cyberpunk vibe that eventually became so popular. And some of the most exciting examples to me of the 1980s aesthetic of the future are actually movies like Blade Runner or Brazil where they're remixing old and new in an entirely new way, as opposed to just assuming that the future will be so distant from the past that it will have no connection to it. All right, 1990s, my ashamed glory days, the age of cyberpunk darkness. Of course, you all know the Matrix, hackers, like I, li I literally thought this was me and then I was in this world and I was the coolest kid ever. Um, this was a very dark vision of the future and we thought there was just gonna be this uh, almost circuit board chic, I would call it, aesthetic. This was the moment where irregular geometries started to play this really prominent role where apparently um, subtle design choices were totally out and everything had to be as over-designed as possible because that was the future. <laughs> And as fashion took on a very kind of gothy, matrixy quality, as well as this interesting cyberpunk vibe. And if you wanna know if you're in a cyberpunk future, just look for two things. Is it raining? And has an Asian multicorp taken over the entire world? Then you're definitely in like a cyberpunk world. Um, and the reason why cyberpunk became so prominent in this era is because in the 90s, Japan represented the future to the, most of, to the rest of the world. 
And so its aesthetic, this kind of hypermodern samurai, began to define how we imagine the future would look. All right, 2000s, the age of abundance. If I hear one more person talk about the Minority Report screen and how they want it, I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> oh no, keep hitting the wrong thing. The dominant tech here, mixed reality, AR, VR, of course that started to define how we saw the future. And in, um, in this era, it was really a very decadent future. It was almost like, let's design for Tony Stark in a spaceship on Mars, for Silicon Valley billionaires. I mean, just because we can means we definitely should. That's the future we're gonna live in. I almost called it like alien lux. Like it's a little, out. I don't even know what's happening. We were convinced that instead of going into our computers, which was the fantasy of the 90s and the 80s, that the computers would come out and be a part of us in the world around us. We wanted to touch and feel our own digital power. And friendly robots really started getting into the picture at this moment that were way beyond the cliche of 80s Terminator. And I'm pretty convinced that the reason why some of these robots look so friendly is so that you're not terrified of them. It's so that you realize they're not gonna take my jobs, they're just gonna hug me. Look at how cute they are. This isn't bad, this is good. <laughs> All right, 2010s, we're getting there. The age of quiet minimalism. This is what I kind of secretly picture when I close my eyes and I look at the future. 2010s, the dominant tech here, maybe early days of AI. I mean, there was a lot of interesting things going on. And you can think of this almost as if we were craving a minimalist monastery of the future, a fantasy of the future as calm and quiet, almost an attempt to tame all of the sociological and technological change that was happening and say, the future will deliver us from chaos. The future will deliver us from chaos. We will go to a clean white room and we will all be safe. That was our fantasy. Even the aesthetics of the products that we imagined living in the future started to follow this like minimalist, silent, quiet, just be, don't, don't be in my face, do be the opposite of minority report. Please just gently be there, don't bug me, don't steal my attention. I don't even know what half of these products do, and that's the point. Everything in the future, apparently, was an iPhone. It was going to look exactly like the Apple design language. It was taking over the world. And the aesthetics of the fashion of the future started to get very austere and tight and rigid. Like, the future is Jodie Foster in a white pantsuit as the administration. Like, that's the future. <laughs> and we started seeing this trend towards aesthetics where the human was very, very tiny and then they, they had a massive sense of scale and beauty so that you had a feeling of transcendence, like you were opening up to this new reality. Nature was being invited in for one of the first times. If you imagine back all of the other photos I showed, nature was being pushed out as much as possible. And then in the age of minimalism, we're slowly starting to invite it back in. Homes built on the side of a cliff. This was just a fantasy render that someone had created, and some billionaire said, I want it, and they're actually making it now. That's how the aesthetics of the future work. We're seeing a real hunger now for nature mixed into the conversation of what the future will look like. Not a battle anymore, not us versus them, not us trying to prove that we're so much superior to nature, but actually in movies like Ex Machina, literally his home is half fusion of both worlds in the most beautiful way. And biological aesthetics, we talked about this earlier, doctor, uh, that biological aesthetics very well may take over the conversation of what the aesthetics of the future look like. And that's a beautiful thing. I mean, a stingray civilization that's going through the ocean beautifully, that beats a lot of the things we're seeing out in the world. Think of things like the elegance and the poetry of Arrival, or the gentle bio-organic silvers of Ex Machina. Okay. So now, we finally made it to the present, we're gonna look ahead. But unfortunately, or fortunately, there's not one single answer. It is an eclectic remix, it's uncategorizable, that's actually an incredibly beautiful thing. 
Has anyone here seen the movie Idiocracy by chance? Anyone know this like from the, right? So you, you remember at the time where you're like, we're not gonna wear fashion like that. That's the ugliest thing in the entire world. How could that possibly be the future? We are living in the future that Idiocracy predicted where ugly fashion, brutalist on purpose, is becoming the trend and may continue to go even further. And psychologically, I, I have a, a theory, who knows, that the reason why this is happening is because one way to cope with all of this technological change is to crave minimalism, right? We wanna simplify, we wanna streamline, we wanna go down. But another way is to say, I'm just going straight in. I'm gonna dive into the storm, I'm gonna spike it up, and I'm just gonna serve it raw. Like, I'm gonna embrace all of that chaos and just wear it and be proud. And this is not just kids. This is not just a subculture. This is NASA's new astronaut suit they just came up with. Brutalist, ugly, beautiful, I love it, in collaboration with a whole group of uh, teenagers from across the world. Maybe this is the aesthetic of the future. Have you guys seen this? <laughs> like, like maybe that's it. It's, it's amazing, right? Some friends of mine at the Extrapolation Factory recently took over a bodega in New York City and turned it into a time warp machine where you could buy implants and reputation index and mood surveys and just hid all of these futuristic products right near the like bug spray and Drano. And they sold weird things like that. I don't even know. I think it was a new way to eat food intravenously. But the idea was they were trying to take this elitist futurism off the shelf, off the elitist shelf, and bring it down to the people. Make it accessible, be playful with it, ask new questions. We're now a bunch of hyper-aware hype beasts who are basically trolling ourselves with future provocations that are designed to agitate all of the old cliches of what we used to think beauty looked like. And that's an awesome thing. It's amazing. I mean, when I asked friends of mine to send me a single image that represented the aesthetics of the future. Evan, I don't know where he is, he's somewhere in here. Evan sent me this one, like industrial clunk that could survive any apocalypse. That's awesome. Maybe that's the aesthetics of the future. But we're also seeing some absolutely new beautiful visuals where complex colors and textures are coming back into the mix. And again, it's another example of the dominant technology of the age defining the aesthetics. Because Cinema 4D is now making this possible, we're reimagining how we're seeing the future. CGI futurism is coming to play, and it is not taking itself too seriously anymore. I'm going to let this play so that you can all just enjoy the beauty and the playfulness and the amazingness of seeing man and machine, the dream of the 80s, actually brought to fruition in a beautiful way. my favorite one. I love this one so much. There is a deep poetry to how the human body is now interacting with virtual graphics in magical and amazing ways that I think define the future of aesthetics much more than blue heads spinning off code in robot land. Anyone know who this is? Come on, someone knows. Someone cool and young knows. Sandeep knows. Who is it? She is an AI Instagram superstar. Lil Michaela. Lil Michaela. She's a social media influencer with over 1.5 million followers who has worked with brands like Supreme or Barney's. Uh, she's not real. And she defines what we hope, the current, or the current generation hopes, that the robots of the future will be. Basically, just casual robot buds. Like, yeah, okay, they're not um, doing the most amazing things in the world, but they're cool and I kind of want to hang out with them. Like, this is her interviewing celebrities right now. Or her saying, like, oh, it's not every day a little robot turns 19. Thanks for all the gifts, everybody. Love you. I can't even count all of the diverse aesthetics of the future 
that we're starting to see pop up. Anyone guess what this aesthetic is? What it's trying to do? Do you know? Can you? Okay, don't say it. Uh, it's to avoid facial detection. Fashion to hide from facial detection software. That's epic. I love that. It's incredible. Or how about scrap fashion? Scrap fashion upcycling. It's amazing. The new Harajuku kids. We all knew Harajuku kids were the future then. Like, look at them now. A Pakistani artist who's mixing sci-fi with everyday life. This. Neo-goth crystals. I mean, I have friends back home in Boston who are convinced that this is the future, and they're like just dressing like this with weird crystals in their heads. This is not a joke. <laughs> um, yeah, OK, we had cyberpunk, but now there's biopunk. There's nanopunk. There's, uh, I don't even know, biopunk, solar punk, nanopunk. We still have the dream of merging humans with machines, but now it's becoming much more poetic. It's becoming something authentically beautiful. This, I don't even know what this is. I love it. This, these might be the aesthetics of the future, not those cliches. Gentle nature survivalists with this fantasy of returning to the earth, returning to animals and actually carrying our, our um, homes on our backs, which is not just an academic exploration. Like these are literally solar powered refugee homes. Those are tents on your back. That's the future aesthetics. Or Victoria Modesta, Bionic pop star with one leg who has decided to make this a complete fashion statement. Play a quick little video. It's incredible. This aesthetic is introducing entirely new things to the conversation. Or this, Farah Al Qasimi, local Emirati artist. I am convinced that she is tapping into something more magical about the uh, aesthetics of the future than a lot of the other cliches. Afrofuturism. You guys all know it, it's been epic forever, but of course, with Black Panther, it has reignited this new sense of cultural pride. And I would be curious what would happen if Arabic futurism did the same. Is there a chance, I don't know, the new Dune movie maybe? Like, is there an opportunity for Arabic futurism to take the center stage, have a point of view, and really proudly declare who it is? Some really beautiful examples happening in Arabic future surrealism. I don't even know what's going on, but I love it. Or questions around the aesthetics of places of worship. Like maybe it's us bowing to robots, maybe? Or maybe it's this, right? Maybe it's a more magical, immersive aesthetic to the places that we won't actually want to be. Or this. Or this. This is a mosque in Lebanon that's actually blending the old mosque with the new mosque in a completely beautiful way. There's been this um, insurgence of a gooey kind of aesthetic of the future. Again, another um, result of Cinema 4D. And there's nobody who does it more beautifully than Lucy McRae, who has invented a concept for a bed when you sleep alone at night that cuddles you so that you don't feel alone. It's so magical. It releases OxyContin. It's really healing. I know this freaks a lot of you out, but I authentically think this is beautiful. <laughs> Not all of the conversations of the aesthetics of the future you're going to like, and that's OK. <coughs> Another example of like GUI interfaces, this is the rolly keyboard that's hypersensitive to touch. So based on the way that you caress it and you play it, it reacts completely differently. Her absolute favorite in the kind of gentle vein of futurism. There's a warm corduroy, vintage futurism, transparent, whoever said transparent feeling going on here, where the tech is gently inside. It's not exposed. We're still living in a world that feels beautiful, but yes, it's technological underneath. Or how about maximalism until it hurts futurism? Or all of the new tech that's actually not about changing the form of what you're wearing, but what happens inside like Levi's collaboration with Google, to create new solar-powered mechanics that you can actually just charge your cell phone by putting it on, on your normal jean jacket. Things like Neri Oxman and all the amazing work happening in the MIT Media Lab, like soft interfaces where they're actually figuring out, can we control water droplets with code as opposed to just clunky buttons that we push? Maybe that's the aesthetic of the future. Tech and fashion enabling entirely new forms. Anyone see these? 
Like Khloe Kardashian's implant, crazy. It's not actually real, glows in the dark, but like it's a provocation. If we start with human body augmentation, how do we want that to look? And everything Bjork has ever done or ever will do, I basically just think Bjork is the aesthetic of the future. You're welcome, the end. <laughs> All right, Whew. I know that was a whirlwind. And obviously there's no single answer to what the aesthetics of the future will be. But while each era had its own defining characteristics, there are some shared tensions or qualities that came through. So a few to keep in mind. Five design tensions. And I'm not picking sides. I'm not saying like this one's good, that one's bad, we should just go this way. The tension is the beauty. That's the point. One. The future is less, the future is more. Simple design tension. Why less? Because life is complicated and messy. And we have a fantasy that we will have a world of quiet in this world of noise. That technology will deliver us from all of the chaos and help simplify the realities and chaos of our day-to-day -day lives. And why more? Because we've always been taught that, more, that progress equals more. So of course that's like more tech or more glowing things or more whatever, or a more crazy crowded place. Oops, come on. Two. The future is shiny and sleek. The future is fuzzy and organic. And why shiny and sleek? Because it's not natural. Because we made it, humans. We are so much more powerful than nature. Anything that nature made, anything organic, anything earthy, anything brown, that feels like the past to us. Anything that we make, in a technologically advanced way, that feels like the future. But that's been the cliche for ages, and now as we're starting to realize that we can collaborate with nature in an entirely new way, that might be why the future also is starting to feel more fuzzy and organic, because that becomes the definition of us collaborating um, with technology. All right, two more. The future is inside our bodies, the future is inside our heads. Obviously our bodies are the next technological frontier and we may still be wearing t-shirts in the future but we'll have uh, eye color that our parents picked out for us. But more excitingly, maybe the future is in our heads. We're seeing this deep spiritual reawakening happening globally. Everything from meditation to microdosing, where people are suddenly craving a much more mystical, soulful aesthetic in how they imagine their own personal futures. Four. The future is austere and severe. The future is playful and poetic. We assume the future is sans serif. That's just the rule. I mean, I can't tell you the number of clients I've had in my life who are like, I want my brand to be more futury, which means I want a sans serif font and a really crisp, clear line. Because we love the unmessiness of it, how technical it feels, that it's unmarred by all the chaos of being human. But we're not gonna stop being silly, imperfect, beautiful, complex, emotional human beings just because we exist in the future. The primal needs of today, of play, of connection, of self-expression, of meaning, of purpose, are still going to be the things that we crave tomorrow, even if robots are driving us to work. And finally, the future is omnicorp global, or the future is eclectic microtribalism. We worry there might be one winner, right? The Dow chemical, as I was talking about with Matt earlier today, one winner to rule them all. The same company selling us um, our vacuums to our restaurants to our robot companions. Like there is a simplicity and beauty to this idea that it is all just gonna be one and then it's all gonna be over and it's all gonna be done. But we all know that the beauty is in our diversity and that the future is diverse and distributed. We are all craving a connection to our cultural heritage. And I was thinking about things like um, oriental rugs. Oriental rugs have existed for centuries and I'm pretty sure they will exist in the future. They mean something to us. They're beautiful, they've lasted. So maybe oriental rugs are actually futuristic. 
And one example of all of these uh, tensions working together in harmony is actually the design language that we created for the Museum of the Future. So a Palmwood project in collaboration with Dubai Future Foundation was to look at how do we create the emotional space when someone's here to, to uh, shift how they feel about the future. So they're not scared of it, so that they embrace this duality. And this was just an internal video. This is not meant for public consumption. Sorry, internet, but it's OK. <laughs> I'm just going to let it play. to the world to bring a more multi-sensory nuance and a local flavor to the conversation of what the future will look like. Essentially, the future needs your voice, every single one of you, from whatever perspective that you're bringing. So where is your cultural identity showing up in this? Arabic, biotech, fashion designer, whatever it is you're doing. Where is your voice, radical, circularity, architect? I don't even know what half of you are, and that's OK. Um, what new edge would you add, multi-sensory AR designer? A challenge I want to leave you with. No matter your role, no matter what it is you do, when you're creating something for the future, which is all of us because you can't create anything for the past, <laughs> I want to give you guys three challenges just to think about in the back of your mind. Am I relying on the easy stock visuals? I mean, just think of the number of things we went through today. There are so many beautiful new provocations out there, and I know you all could create new ones too. In this future, what are we giving up, and what are we gaining? Are we giving up something that's so deeply important to our cultural heritage by just replacing it with lasers and robots? It's a question. And most importantly, is this a future I personally want to live in? Personally, like you personally ask yourself that. So our choices are going to define us. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>